in an era when games were dead. Kaboom! There was virtually no console market in the U.S. Nobody bought consoles, nobody bought video games. An unknown company takes a big gamble. Nintendo was not well known. In fact, newscasters would mispronounce the word Nintendo. They, they, they just couldn't get it right. This is the story of the rebirth of the gaming industry. What we've done is to single-handedly recreate a dead industry. Suddenly, Nintendo, a Japanese newcomer, comes in and has a new console and says, hey, everybody, let's play games again. The Nintendo Entertainment System completely revitalized what was a dead industry. It re-injected life. It made kids love video games again. This is the NES. While disco breathes its last breath, and Jimmy Carter loses the presidential elections to a Hollywood actor named Reagan, America is ending its love affair with gaming. In the early 1980s, the home video game business in the United States collapsed. There was virtually no console market in the US. It was all after the kind of the crash of Atari. So gamers took, took a step back and, you know, opened their doors and went outside and saw the sun and, and, and did some other things for a while. Nobody bought consoles, nobody bought video games. <laughs> a smart bubble. I think a lot of it was just because the, they got bored with the games. The games weren't high enough quality to really have people want to continue to play them. It was usually referred to as the Atari debacle. There was a tremendous buildup of inventory of Atari home video game systems and a, a complete collapse, which cost a lot of people jobs. But in Japan, gaming is alive and well, thanks in part to a company called Nintendo. Nintendo's 150 years old, started out making these playing cards. Nintendo did a lot of things in the meantime. You know, they had love hotels. Without going into too much detail, love hotels are the hotels that do really well because rooms can get booked four or five times in a night. They got out of that, but they did a whole lot of other stuff too. We were also in the consumer business selling the small Nintendo game and watch. So actually, we were in the handheld business before the home video game business. Then they tried to break into the arcade business. Their first attempts weren't very successful. They had Sheriff, which was an okay game. They had a game called Radar Scope. Did quite well in Japan, but not in America. Nintendo's biggest success in Japan is the Famicom, a unique game console developed by Masayuki Uemura. It was based on a family computer is what they originally launched it over there, and they just shortened it up to Famicom. The Famicom was introduced in 1983. The launch was very, very successful. The collapse of the home video game business was really a US market thing. It was not something that had occurred in Japan. It was a little tiny 8-bit box, red and white. Actually, really funny looking. It was really small. It's only about this big. But uh, games on it were a lot of fun to play. The uh, system was well received because of the increased graphics capability of the uh, product, as well as uh, some really great games. So it took off, and it was uh, not only successful, it was extraordinarily successful. Nintendo makes a daring decision to bring the Famicom to America, and its timing couldn't be worse. Popular Famicom.
Nintendo is about to bring their popular Famicom video game console to U.S. shores, and the odds are stacked against them. The game industry was in turmoil, and into that terrible market, suddenly Nintendo, a Japanese newcomer, comes in and has a new console and says, hey, everybody, let's play games again. But first, the Famicom needs to become more American-friendly. It just didn't fall into American taste. It looked very Fisher-Price, and... Uh, we also didn't want to launch just a game platform because everybody at retail was saying another game platform. We did that. We just got done with that. Why would we want to do that again? So we had to come up with something a little bit more Americanized and something with more of a hook to it. Our designers here at Nintendo of America thought that it ought to have a little bit more high-tech look. Nintendo of America turns the Famicom into a new unit dubbed the Advanced Video System. It had a music keyboard and a keyboard and, you know, the console itself, and it was real flat and sleek and gray and black. The Advanced Video System was really skinny. I mean, it was only about this tall, and it was a top-loading cartridge design. So we went and showed that at the Consumer Electronics Show. And the reaction that we got from the retailers was very negative. Nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to touch it. No one was interested in it because it was a home video game system. And then we came back from that show, and our president, Mr. Arakawa, called myself and my designer and said, you know, this, this is the shape of what they want to um, produce the NES in here. Can you make it look good? And you've got an hour to do it. <laughs> And so we went back to the drafting board and we were all pissed off and because we'd spent all this time on this other design, but we came up with that gray and, uh, and you know, the stripe across the top in about an hour and came back in and presented it to him and poof, the next thing we knew, that was what it was. You know, while we lost the keyboards, both of them, um, there was a little, uh, it was a floppy drive and we lost that. It was just the two controllers and the box itself. The front-loading cartridge slot isn't the only feature that sets this system apart from others. There's this weird rectangular control pad, you know, with the with a little cross-shaped D-pad. I'm like, what? I don't even understand what this was because I'm used to having joysticks in my games and with two little red buttons. And I thought, you know, it's weird, but it's comfortable. It works. The Japanese company then approaches Atari for a partnership. The deal that we proposed to Atari was that we would uh, sell the product on an OEM basis to uh, Atari and give Atari um, the opportunity to distribute it not only in the United States but throughout the world. We knew that Atari was synonymous with uh, video games and that Nintendo was not even known by the average consumer. But Atari turns down the offer and Nintendo decides to go it alone. Well, in the early 80s, uh, Mr. Yamauchi was president of Nintendo Company Limited, the worldwide leader of Nintendo. He gave uh, Nintendo of America uh, the opportunity to see if we could uh, launch the home video game system. We thought that we would test market the product in a small market area. And we explained that to him at a meeting sometime in early 1985, and he threw up his hands and said, no, the test market will be New York City. If you can succeed in New York City, you'll succeed anywhere, and if you fail, then you fail, and that's it. The outlook for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, is bleak. We decided that we would have a focus group, and we would show the NES, and the reaction of these kids was absolutely negative. It was astounding. The results of the test, uh, the experts said, the best thing you can do is not introduce this product. It's not going to be well received. It's not going to be accepted. But Nintendo is undeterred. After making a few additions to the NES to set it apart from traditional gaming consoles, the Japanese company prepares to roll the dice. So in early 1985, our, the engineers at Nintendo Company Limited came up with Rob the Robot, which was uh, made part of the Nintendo Entertainment System. So when we went to the retailers, we were saying, no, this isn't a home video game like Atari. This has Rob the Robot. And then we positioned it as an entertainment system. You also had a uh, zapper, and those things combined with it kind of put it over the top and made it look like it's just not a game console. To get retailers to carry this system, Nintendo offers a win-win scenario. Let us put it in. Let us 
put some displays in that we will bring to your retail outlets and you don't have to pay us until the end of the year. Not only that, but Nintendo would buy back any unsold NES units. On October 18, 1985, Nintendo takes the plunge and releases the NES in select stores throughout New York City. Now the fate of this little gray box is in the hands of the Big Apple. Nintendo takes what many see to be a suicide dive into the video game console market with the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985. They ship 50,000 units to select stores throughout New York City. So it was an uphill fight to enter the market with the NES in, in 1985. Nintendo was not well known. In fact, in my case, I remember listening to newscasters or to meeting people who would mispronounce the word Nintendo. They just, they just couldn't get it right. But the system's unique appearance and strong lineup of games catches the public eye. When I first saw the NES, I thought, like, wow, that's so futuristic looking. And it comes with a robot. And it's, it's got this lid that opens. It's like from the future. It's amazing. Coming off being a fan of Atari 800 or ColecoVision and television, you know, the Atari 2600, the NES was pretty spectacular as far as what it could do. And a home version of Super Mario Brothers by Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Donkey Kong, makes the NES a must-buy for gamers. Miyamoto is one of those rare people who brought something new to gaming. They're these shining figures, these shining stars of gaming who introduce a new gameplay concept. So I'm looking for the $2 to $5 ColecoVision games, and all of a sudden I see Super Mario Brothers, which I had just become addicted to in the arcade. And it was like, Super Mario Brothers? Oh, wow. So I go around the corner to the other aisle, and there's the NES, and it's $80 with Super Mario Brothers. It's like, tick, OK, sold. Yeah, Super Mario Brothers was, you know, it remains one of the best games ever made. It shows just how far ahead Nintendo was from everybody else. Super Mario, you know, was the first game. For Mario, I mean, Mario was, of course, the first game to become a really huge hit all around the world and generate lots and lots of fans. And so that, of course, you know, I mean, Mario will always be close to me. We didn't sell all 50,000, but it was enough of a success that Toys R Us and other retailers said, why don't you expand uh, to a few other markets in 1986? But in early 1986, we made the decision that based upon the success of the NES in New York City, that we would uh, expand and go nationwide. By the end of 1986, the thing just took off. Amazing. And by Christmas of uh, 87, 88, there were millions of units sold worldwide. There were already a few games that had broken a million units. It, it was pretty obvious that the game industry was back, you know, alive and well. The NES succeeded because it had kick-ass games. There was Metroid. Obviously, later, there was The Legend of Zelda. By 1987, 5.4 million NES units are sold. Nintendo's lineup is also boosted by a number of third-party games. We went out to a number of software companies, both in the United States and in Japan, and we were successful in bringing four or five on board, uh, Data East, Capcom, Bandai. To make sure the mistakes made by the game industry in the past aren't repeated, Nintendo devises a special system for developers who wish to make games for the NES. A number of us studied the Atari debacle very closely, and one of the reasons they had not succeeded was they had not been able to maintain quality control over the software that was played on the hardware. But we wanted to make sure that if other people introduced games to the NES, they would introduce it under a licensing uh, system that Nintendo would control, and that Nintendo would control the quality. 
third-party games that get approved for the NES are given the official Nintendo stamp of approval. But this same system will lead to some big legal battles. When 1988 rolls around, Nintendo's NES has an established base of 9.4 million units throughout the United States. The gray and black Japanese console is king of the hill. But that doesn't mean there isn't any competition. The first legitimate competition was Sega. The, the console wars started between Sega and Nintendo with the Sega Master System and the Nintendo Entertainment System. The thing was, brand loyalty ran so deep for me, at least as a child, that when I actually went to the department store and played a Sega Master System, I felt like I was cheating on my spouse. It was like I felt dirty and icky, so I ran home to my Nintendo and went, went back and played that instead. The Sega Master System would go on to sell only 2 million units in its lifetime and capture just 11% of the gaming market. The biggest problems for Nintendo come from legal battles rather than competition. One of the most notable conflicts Nintendo faces is with Tengen. Well, you had to license your games from Nintendo, you had to pay Nintendo a fee to manufacture it, you had to let Nintendo manufacture the cartridges for it. Where Tengen, which was an offshoot of Atari, was making unlicensed games for the NES. They concluded that they could go around the licensing system that we had in place and manufacture their own games for play on the Nintendo Entertainment System without the necessity of a license. And we got into litigation with them, but we were successful. Those lawsuits were all decided in uh, Nintendo's favor, and I think that was really the first and last time that, that any company really made a, an attempt to get around uh, the copyrights and patents that surrounded the Nintendo Entertainment System or the licensing uh, system that was in place. Some game companies complain that Nintendo's control over third-party developers is too strict. But by 1990, Nintendo controls 80% of the gaming market. And if publishers wanted in, they had to play by Nintendo's rules. Yeah, well, Nintendo had pretty, um, I would maybe call them aggressive business practices, and they would really restrict publishers to only bringing out, like, a couple games a year. Uh, getting games approved for play on the Nintendo system was somewhat an arduous task at times. Nintendo in the early days would allocate specific products that you were going to do. They would allocate specific times that you could release them. They had tremendous testing checklists that we had to go through, and they would test the game and be pretty nitpicky about some of the things that were in it. Nintendo's strict policies lead to an investigation by the FTC, and the matter is eventually settled out of court. Later, the game company sues Comerica over its Game Genie cheating device, and this time, Nintendo loses. The Game Genie was like your way of being the hacker. I can get in there and I can give myself infinite lives and I can warp all the way to the end. Nintendo didn't like it, obviously, because you could rent a game and beat it. By 1991, games like Super Mario Bros. 3 and Shadowgate pushed the NES to its peak, giving Nintendo 90% of the U.S. video game market. From the official Nintendo Power magazine to Nintendo accessories, toys, and even cereal, the Nintendo invasion is complete. Growing up for me, Nintendo was the brand that meant everything to me. My nickname in elementary school was Nintendo Boy. I ate Nintendo cereal. I, I was like so obsessed with Nintendo Power magazine. It's a miracle I didn't get beat up more often. There's this monthly magazine that was giving you tricks, that was giving you previews of other games coming out, and you felt like, you know what, I'm a gamer now. I had like the video game t-shirts, and like I got a patch that said, I saved the princess, and I even had my power glove, which I kind of like rock, like I was like looking cool with it, you know, playing Mike Tyson's punch out. But eventually, the NES has to make way for newer, more powerful systems. The NES eventually had to evolve into something more powerful. Sega came in with its Genesis, which was a 16-bit machine. All of a sudden, we're seeing more colors, livelier, more realistic animation, and a lot of different kind of games that you weren't able to play on the NES before. Well, certainly, Technology was moving on finally, in, and we were on to uh, the Super NES and 16-bit 
processors and just another jump in graphics capabilities and, and gameplay. And I, I think, you know, that was inevitable. That, that was eventually going to happen. Kind of started the cycle, I guess you see today, of uh, technology and new systems coming out every few years. As time goes by, game consoles steadily grow more and more powerful. But no matter what the future brings, the impact of the NES on the world of gaming will never be forgotten. You look back and the, the NES was the system we all grew up with. It had all the great games and established all these huge, huge franchises. The NES brought gaming back and it made it very, very popular. And it actually transcended continents. It was popular in Japan, it was popular in the US and Europe, something that hadn't really happened with the Atari console before it. The NES basically shattered the whole idea that gaming was a fad that's never to come back. I think the video game industry would not be where it is today without the Nintendo Entertainment System. If you think about it today, the NES is like, for a lot of people, you know, a whole generation of gamers, the NES is where it all started. There's no question in my mind that if we had not successfully launched the NES, um, that the home video game business would not exist as we know it. Thank you.